Welcome to the Spot On Insurance Podcast, brought to you by Insurance Licensing Services of America, ILSA. This is Ted Tavares. And this is Arlene Tavares coming to you from beautiful Puerto Rico. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at a topic that affects every single one of us. But before we get started, don't forget to click on the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And now here's our host, Doug Foresta. Hello and welcome to Spot on Insurance. This is your host, Doug Foresta. With me today is Michael Tracy from salesjourney.com. He is the founder and he has spent the last 10 years in the trenches in sales leadership and telecommunications, marketing, uh, and other areas. And I'm excited to have him here today. We're going to be talking about sales success. Michael Tracy, welcome to Spot on Insurance. Uh, thank you so much, Doug. It's good to be here. Let's start with, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about sales success. And let's start with a question about how do I find more prospects? Can you share your words of wisdom with us about that? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, this is like the number one question I get to in my training practice is, you know, how do I find a great lead source? You know, how do I identify more lead sources? Where do I find people to call, to meet with? Uh, and I think we live in an interesting time. You know, there's social media has never been more prevalent. And so the options out there are, manifold. They're, they're all over the place. Uh, so I, I focus people in on how to leverage social media, uh, how to use and really get uh, results from LinkedIn, because LinkedIn can be a crapshoot if you don't know what you're doing. Um, but I think the most important lead source for uh, you know people in financial services and insurance professionals is their existing customers, their existing clients, and really kind of selling through from the initial point of contact and, and really focusing on getting that referral uh, at, a, at a later date. So what sort, of, uh, what sort of level of service would you need to provide in that first or second interaction to get them to become not only you know, your customer, but also a fan and an advocate, and then go around and actually recruit people and send them to you uh, for more business? That's great. And that actually ties in with uh, the second point that I was going to ask you about, which was getting more appointments. So how do I get people? It's one thing to get prospects, but how do I get people to actually uh, set up appointments with me? Right. And so actually, this this is something I teach too. It's one of the first things I teach. And oftentimes we make the mistake as sales professionals, we get really excited and enthusiastic about our product or service. And so as soon as we identify somebody that might be interested, uh, we tell them all about it. Right. And so it's what we call a throwing up on the customer. And yes. I, I advise against that, especially when you're selling something like insurance or financial services. I usually teach uh, for most most sales professionals, I teach something called the three sales method. And what that means is essentially breaking out one sale into three different parts. And the first part is when you really get to sell yourself. Right. You're selling yourself as an authority, as a professional, somebody who's honest, somebody who has references. Uh, and really selling your credibility. The second sale is for time. You know, time is a valuable resource, just like money. And before you can ask somebody to pay for anything, you have to first sell them on on time. And that's and that's the appointment. And so if you go out with the mentality, look, I just need to sell people on appointments. Number one, it takes the pressure off, right? You're not trying to sell your product yeah. or service. You're not trying to throw up all over the customer. You're really just trying to engage them, kind of from your genuine, true self. You're trying to expose that you are credible, you are an authority, and then you can sell them and close them on an appointment. And the appointment offers you all kinds of wonderful things. First of all, it gives you the, um, the ability to actually show up on time and fulfill your first commitment, which also adds to your credibility. But then it's a mutual agreement that you get to talk about your product or service. And so you don't have to speak quickly. You don't have to get it all out really fast. You get to take your time, ask the right questions, listen, and then present your solutions in a more natural and calm and calm way. Thanks so much for that. Well, let's talk about, let's move on to qualifying prospects. So obviously, you know, for an insurance, we're an insurance agent, we want prospects, but we want qualified prospects. So can you say a little bit about, you know, what does it mean to be a qualified prospect? What is it to qualify a prospect? And how do I qualify a prospect in a reasonable amount of time? 
Yeah. So a qualified prospect has a need, a desire, and an ability to pay. So a need is is obvious. They they actually need your they genuinely need it, right? Now, if you're a really great sales professional, you can probably sell things to people that they don't need, but that would result in kind of our, our core goal, right, is to get a referral or a reference after the sale is made. So a need, a desire, right, which is which is the want. And you can actually create desire uh, through education, uh, by uh, having a persuasive and influential presentation. And then uh, the one thing that you can't much affect is the ability to pay. If they don't have you know, money, then that really hampers your ability to make a sale. And so those would be the three main ones, need, desire, and money. Now, if you're dealing with you know, a larger enterprise or you're dealing in a situation where there's multiple stakeholders, the two other pieces or qualifying criteria are authority and timing. So you need to figure out if the person can actually make a decision regarding whether or not they can buy from you or not. And the other thing is timing. You know, a lot of times uh, with larger enterprises or bigger organizations, they only buy at a certain point in the quarter. And so those would be the five. Need, desire, money, authority, and timing. And if you get all those, then you've got a really qualified prospect. Thank you. Well, you know, that segues nicely into what I want to talk about next, which, you know, you were talking about slowing things down, slowing the sale down. And of course, you know, there's the importance of building trust and rapport in the sales process. And I was wondering if you could say a bit about how do I go about building that trust and rapport uh, initially, and then also over time, how do I build up that trust and rapport? That's that's a really really great question. I get that one frequently. Uh, So one of the issues with insurance and just financial financial services in general is it's a highly commoditized product, right? There's not a lot of differentiation when it comes to different types of insurance other than price. And so the key factor then is how do you differentiate a highly commoditized product? And the only way to really do that is with with yourself, right? Your presentation going to be the the trust and rapport that you create. Uh, and to do that, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, there's probably a lot of psychology behind that. But what I find to be the most effective is when you're really comfortable with yourself and your knowledge base and your competence in your industry. So it's really hard to duplicate that and to be just genuine and to really be focused on your prospects needs and wants and to want to serve them genuinely and deliver a product that really is going to give them long-term value is probably the best way to do that. And that, that's something that not only once you do it once by serving that customer, you're going to basically create a reputation and that will be able to be leveraged for, to get more customers. And so that goes back to selling through to the referrals at the end of the sales process. Thank you. I love that. And and that dovetails nicely into the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is, you know, the stand up presentation piece. And I know that you say that teaching is the new selling. Can you explain what you mean by that? Uh, I mean, I'll give you a little history lesson. So if we go back to like 1985, uh, in 1985, you were talking about the height of what they call transactional sales. If you ever seen uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Roth, You know, it's to always be closing. And the reason why is because in 1985, if you were a sales professional, everybody was calling you. The salesperson had the information, right? They had the knowledge. They knew how long it would take to implement the installation, whatever it happened to be. They they were the authorities. And so if somebody was calling you, that demonstrated intent. And so the minute they you started talking to them, you could start closing them on your product or service. Well, that changed. And I'm, I'm approximating, but that all changed in about 1995. And that's when the internet really kind of came on the scene and democratized information. So now anybody with uh, internet access could go and find out all the questions, to, all the answers to all the questions that they had, get all the information. And so the sales profession had to adjust. And that's when they came up with you know, uh, consultative selling or solution selling. And this usually involved asking a ton of questions, interviewing your customer, really kind of divulging and finding needs and pain points. And you take all of that together and then you present your solution or your relief to their pain. But those questions take a lot of time. You know, they took a a lot of the prospect's time. And what we see now, now that the internet has proliferated, the barriers to entry to starting creating new companies is lower than ever before. 
there's so many options. There's so many niche players and there's so many different options that the prospect kind of knows already what they want. Like I want life insurance or I need liability or whatever it happens to be. And they go online to find the best option and they're overwhelmed with hundreds of options. And so they get, you know, a paralysis of analysis and they shut down. And so the best way to cut through that is with what they call, you know, educational selling or insight selling. And it's to front load your presentation with a lesson, something that you can teach them and not just anything. You know, you can't just, you know, talk about inflation. That's common knowledge now. Um, or, or the need for life insurance. You really have to uh, kind of blow their mind. And that only comes from really understanding your industry, really kind of being cutting edge. And then if you front load you know, your presentation with a five to 15 minute lesson, something that they didn't know, something that empowers them, that makes them enthusiastic about your product or service, it's much easier to kind of follow that sale to fruition and close because the end result of you educating them is them feeling empowered and motivated. And not only that, if there are multiple stakeholders, and I say stakeholders like an enterprise, but this could be, you know, a wife or a husband. Right. Now that they're empowered with this education, they can go back to that stakeholder or their wife or husband and say, let me teach you something, right? And so that lesson is now portable and it helps convince not just not just the person, the prospect that they should buy your product or service, but also all the people that are also involved in the decision. That makes a lot of sense. And I do like that movie. Uh, I did love that movie, Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross. But uh, I think what I hear you saying is that uh, in today's world, um, if you want to be a successful salesperson uh, or successful agent, that that transactional way of selling uh, is not the way to go about it. Would that be fair to say? Correct. Now, now, there are exceptions to the rule. I mean, there's still, I mean, if you go to a, you know, a street fair, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, right. you know, transaction-based sales, of course. And, and, you know, uh, the whole solution selling or consultative selling, that, that, still, that still exists. I mean, and it, there's still appropriate times to use that. Uh, but I think the, the evolution, what we're seeing now is that you really need to be a, an expert. You know, you have to be an authority. You have to have insights that you can teach because that's, that's what differentiates you when you're dealing with a commoditized product. Spot on Insurance is sponsored by ILSA, Insurance Licensing Services of America, America's premier licensing and regulatory compliance experts. To learn more about ILSA and the services they provide, visit ilsainc.com. We're going to talk about closing in just a minute, but before we do, I I want to talk about contextual framing. Can you explain what that is and uh, what it has to do with the sales process? Okay, yeah. So framing... uh it's essentially providing context uh, and it allows your, it allows you to transfer your perspective to your prospect. So, you know, if I was in real estate, for example, the first frame I might use would be, you know, interest rates are never going to be lower than they are right now. And then the next frame I might say is, you know, this is, this house is in the school district that you want right now. Each, each time I'm presenting a frame, the prospect is agreeing with me. Right. And then the third one might be, you know, this neighborhood is projected to go up, you know, 20% in the next three years. So the house is never going to be, you know, this, this cheap. And if they agree with all of these frames at the end, I can say, you know, we should probably put an offer on this house today and they'll say, okay, let's do that. Now, the the alternative of that that happening is you present a frame, right? Let's say like you're, you're dealing with somebody who has a financial background. You say, you know, interest rates are going to, are never going to be this low. And they say, Oh, actually, you know, I was just talking to Alan Greenspan and turns out <laughs> that they're probably going to be, they're probably going to be low for the next 10 years. Well, that's why then you, then you have to reframe, right? You have to think of another frame to present. And usually it takes three to four frames, but once they get through each one, then they're living in your world. They're seeing things from your perspective. And when you ask them to make a decision and take action to buy your product, they're ready. Well, let's go ahead and talk about closing, uh, because I know it's something that agents obviously care a lot about. Now, I understand that you once had a closing ratio of 1 to 20, uh, and that's now 1 in 3. So, uh, my question for you is, what advice would you have for a sales agent who maybe they're at that 1 in, you know, 1 in 20 mark, and they want to get to be a 1 in 3, uh, you know, that 1 in 3 close ratio? What, what advice would you have for them? 
Yeah. So that, that was actually in reference to like my, my first job was a uh, door to door salesperson. And so I, I probably knocked on like 20,000 doors and got rejected <laughs> almost 20, almost 20,000 times. Oh my gosh. So what I started doing is I started hearing the objections and then I just started incorporating the objections into the presentation so that I could diffuse it before it even came up. And, and so when we're talking about like insider educational selling, if you do a great job, uh, you know, you're not going to get a lot of objections, but if you do get objections, usually what objections are saying is, um, I don't feel like making a decision right now. Right. Mm. So it's, it's, you have to go back to creating that enthusiasm, uh, and, and that desire to make a decision and to take action. And there's a funny thing about, um, you know, there's a funny thing about creating enthusiasm is it, you can be really enthusiastic when you make your presentation and they can say, Oh, this is awesome. Let me you know, take this back to my wife. Let me think it over. And then they take it back to the wife. And let's say a, a week later you call them and you go, great. Well, are, are, you know, I remember we made that presentation. You, we're all really excited about it. Um, you're ready to sign, sign the paperwork. And they're like, yeah, I'm not really into it. And it's, uh-huh. it's because that, that window, that window of enthusiasm is closed it's about 24 hours, right? 24 hours is if you can generate enough enthusiasm and desire for your product or service, you have about 24 hours before they forgot about all about the enthusiasm. And now they're kind of, they're back into their, what they call their prefrontal cortex, analyzing every little thing again. So you have to go back from the, you have to start over. You have to reignite that enthusiasm and that desire and then ask for the sale again. Um, but to, to go back, I know we got off track a little bit, no, but to go back, the best way to, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the best way to, the best way to do it is to always, oh, after your presentation, if you guys are excited, ask for the sale. Just make sure you ask for it. And, and the, best, the best way to ask for the sale is, is kind of the, what they call the assumptive close. And it's my favorite. And it just, you know, it's, just, it's just saying, hey, you know, Mr. Prospect, the next step is right, that we fill out this paperwork. Or the next step is, is that you sign here. The next step is this. And you start filling up the paperwork for them. You start assuming the sale. And now... If they're not ready, they'll stop you and they'll object. And that objection actually gives you valuable pieces of information because if it's a real objection, then you can put that, you can start putting those in your, into your presentation to diffuse them for next time. Uh, but again, most of the time you can ascertain whether or not the timing is right. And if the timing is not right, sometimes it's not. You just have to you know, practice you know, what I call ambient presence. Right? It's not following up and asking, you know, to fill out the paperwork over and over and over again, it's, it's following up gently, you know, like instead of asking for another meeting or asking for the sale, it's, you know, sending them an article Mm. about their industry and saying, I I thought you might find this valuable or, you know, maybe inviting them out to lunch or, you know, something that's less, uh, you know, invasive. But staying on there. So you're kind of in some way. Exactly. Top, top of mind awareness. That, that should be the goal. It shouldn't be to, to force them to find, to, to, to make a decision. It should just be to appear to be everywhere all the time without being annoying. Any other advice about closing for agents? I, I know that agents will be very interested in this subject. So I wanted to see if you had any other thoughts or, or words of wisdom on the subject. In, in for financial services, financial services and insurance professionals, you know, you, you're going to have the best sense of, you know, whether or not the prospect is ready and willing to make a purchase, you can always go back to kind of the, the classics, right? What I, what I call the sales classics, which is scarcity. So creating scarcity where there was none before, like, for example, you know, these rates are actually going to go up uh, next month. So it would be really great if we could lock them in today by, you know, filling out the paperwork. Um, so scarcity, the fear of loss is another one. You know, I can't guarantee you know, this plan is available next month. So we really should lock it in. I mean, whatever, so I would say the the two big, you know, uh, two big ones are going to be fear of loss, creating a fear of loss for the prospect and then to create a sense of urgency. Uh, And, and really what you do is you create those things, you create a fear of loss, you create a sense of urgency, and then you ask for the sale again. Mm -hmm. So, and, and oftentimes what will happen is the prospect might say something like, Oh, well, okay, well, if it has to be this month, let's do it. I'll take it. (laughs) <laughs> right. So uh, that, that, that would be my suggestion. And also, so and to, to kind of go, go to the last part of the sales process, what I find really valuable too is 
I've created this concept based on what the tech industry calls, you know, minimum viable product. Mm-hmm. Well, I've, I've come up with another acronym. It's minimum viable sale, right? It's the smallest thing that you could sell to someone that would make them a customer. So in, in you know, it's not always the biggest commission, but if you can make them a customer, even a small customer, then you can start really leveraging that customer and really enhancing the lifetime value. Maybe after six months, you can go back and say, you know, well, you had another kid, maybe it's time to you know, increase your life insurance policy. Or you know, you've added you know, a few different employees, there might be a, you know, cost savings to adding these things now, these plans or whatever. So uh, the concept is minimum viable sale. And it's the smallest increment that you could sell to someone um, to your prospect, to your, to your, to a business that makes them a customer. And then that really enables you to leverage and maximize their lifetime value. Well, that makes sense. I mean, that speaks to what you talked about, about not wanting to be a commodity and also what you said about building trust and, you know, building that trust w- with a customer so that I would imagine that minimum viable sale, it gives you the opportunity to, to build that trust. Doug, that, that's exactly right. You're exactly right. And, and, and so it, it really, if you think about it, the sale is less important than the relationship. Hmm. And, if you, and, and you don't want to, you don't necessarily go into the friend zone. You can't be friends with all of your customers. <laughs> right, right, right. But you, but you, can, but you can form, a, you know, a great business relationship with people based on trust, uh, based on accountability, based on timing, based on you know shared interests, um, shared sense of humor, shared personalities things of that nature. Cause ultimately, I mean, especially, especially when you're selling financial service products and insurance, you know, these customers are going to be your customers for a long time. Well, my guest today has been Michael Tracy from salesjourney.com. Michael, I, I said a little bit about you at the beginning, but could you say a little bit more about the work that you do and then how people can, can learn more about you? Yeah. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a speaker and a trainer. Um, I've started a company a training company called sales journey to salesjourney.com. And it really is a holistic training on sales, where you are, how to, how to do career progression, how to really move in the right direction. And what I find is most people know what their sales strategy is, right? And that's to make more sales or get more clients. I mean, that's the strategy. And so I don't focus on strategy. I focus on tactics. I focus on how do you do that? You know, what do you do when you wake up in the morning? You know, how do you make phone calls? What do you write in your emails? How do you get that appointment? You know, what do you, what do you show up with at the appointment? How do you develop that trust and rapport? How do you measure relationships? I mean, there's a lot more than that. I, I don't want to, <laughs> I know we're running out of time, mm-hmm. uh, but if you're curious, uh, feel free to contact me. My email address is michael at michaeltracy.io, or you can go to salesjourney.com to learn more. Uh, and I'd be happy to discuss and talk to you about uh, getting you into training. And I'm releasing an online course uh, in November. So uh, that should be an easy way for you guys to get familiar with, with sales journey. Well, thanks again so much. I really appreciate it. Um, Actually, before you go, I am going to ask you one last question. And that's, if you had one piece of advice, I'm wondering if you have, if you were to talk to an agent and uh, say, this is my number one piece of advice, do you have a sort of best piece of advice when it comes to selling? Yes. uh, Activity. So I, I feel like this is something that people come back to over and over again. It's consistent time and energy and activity every day. And so, um, the, the idea is never stop prospecting. People get really comfortable once they're, you know, their calendar's full of appointments um, or maybe they're going back to their existing customer base and, and they're trying to you know, upsell and resell. Uh, but the biggest mistake I see sales professionals make is they go, you know what, you know, I'm pretty busy, so I don't really need to prospect this week. Hmm. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's kind of the, 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 the you know, it, for every day you prospect, you get 90 days of benefit, right? 90 days of, follow-up calls and appointments and so on and so forth. So if you stop prospecting, you don't feel the pain immediately, uh, but it does catch up with you. And so even if you're just prospecting aggressively for, let's say, an hour a day, because you're so busy with appointments, that's still better than nothing. So reach out, constantly be looking for new business, go to networking events, make cold calls, email, leverage your existing customers, ask them, ask them for referrals. So many sales professionals don't spend an hour a week just calling existing happy customers and saying, is there anybody else that you think would, would really love or enjoy our service, our products or our insurance? So I, I don't think that's one piece of advice, Doug. I think that's it's a, a bunch of advice. I was going to say, but it's pretty good <laughs> advice. <laughs> Nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. So keep the activity level up. 
right? And, and then that just, is. I mean, just to help you with that, I'll give you one last piece of advice. Sure. And this is based on behavioral psychology. Uh, so enthusiasm, what they found out with enthusiasm is that you, if you sit around and you wait to be enthusiastic, it will never happen. You actually have to act enthusiastic to feel enthusiastic. So the, the action actually uh, precedes the feeling. So I would say just pick up the phone, start making calls, go to networking events, be enthusiastic, and eventually you'll feel that way. And that's, there's a cumulative effect that that will have on your energy level. Michael Tracy, thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing your words of wisdom. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Doug. By the way, our show notes and bonus resources can be found on spotoninsurance.com. Subscribe now so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for joining us. 